Hi, my name is Rochelle Goldberg Ruthchild. I will be the moderator for this talk today, sponsored by the Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies. I'm a center associate at the Davis Center, and it's my honor to present Feruza. Feruza Aripova is a PhD candidate in world history at Northeastern University. She's also a center associate at the Davis Center and she's also a visiting scholar at the Harriman Institute at Columbia University. Her research primarily focuses on gender and sexual politics in the late Soviet era. She is currently working on completing her dissertation, tentative, tentatively titled Silencing of Same-Sex Desire in the Post-Soviet Space, Deconstructing the Soviet Legacy. So, Beruza? You're on. All right. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you so much, uh, the Davis Center, for this opportunity. And a special thank you to Rochelle for your utmost support. And greetings from the capital of Corona, AKA New York City. Um, so this talk is a part of my larger dissertation project where I trace the impact and continuity of Soviet criminalization of homosexuality. And I'm particularly interested in the inconsistencies of same-sex discourses in Russia vis-a-vis -vis its former imperial borderlands. Um, today, I will be discussing the effects of early Soviet gender and sexual politics on the Central Asian region, particularly Uzbekistan, and reflect on its relevance to contemporary development. I will also touch upon some of the existing Orientalist tropes associated with the region and the Russian colonial uh, projects. Um, so due to sort of a little disclaimer, um, due to the time constraints, this is more of a, a broad brush presentation. We have to continuously remind ourselves about diversity of gendered experiences, that there are always nuances and differences when it comes to historicizing gender and sexuality. Um, so um, demolishing religious traditions prompted reconstruction of gender laws and manifestation of sexual freedom, including uh, decriminalization of homosexuality in Soviet Russia in the 1920s. The process of uh, building socialist modernity in Uzbek SSR was highly gendered. The construction of new socialist modernity, including emancipation of women, however, excluded a wide range of same-sex practices and behaviors in Russia's former imperial, imperial borderlands. The Bolshevik campaign uh, of massive unla unveiling in the 1920s was known as Hujum, which is attack against old ways, um, which included um, polygyny, female seclusion, bright price. And that campaign also coincided with constraining sexual ambivalence in the region, including, including prohibiting all ma male same-sex practices. And for example, the Soviet Uzbek Criminal Code of 1926 contained a number of articles prohibiting male same-sex relations. So the Bolsheviks banned the tradition of the so-called boy dancers on par with consensual adult same-sex relations. Where our, whereas homosexuality would not be criminalized in Soviet Russia until 1934. So this campaign of massive unveiling of women overlapped with banning of all same-sex practices. Uh, and moreover, they all kind of lumped them into one category. Um, deconstructing the political history of Soviet prejudice against homosexuality is quite a complex, complex task because it encompasses many histories shaped by ideology, power, gender class, ethnicities and geographical locations. Uh, Post-colonial scholars like Madina Tlastanova argues that the Soviet Union as a multi-ethnic empire was quote, complex and variegated within itself and it was never homogenous. By identifying the USSR as a subaltern empire, she further argues that it didn't have one ideology that would be consistently implemented for all different others. In a way, this concept of subaltern seeks to deconstruct these dominant hegemonic narratives and recognize and recover voices of marginalized individuals and groups repressed by the hegemonic social order. And I guess one of the prevailing hegemonic narratives revolved around the Soviet attempts to kind of liberate quote unquote women and put all these backward practices in the region. And this was the so-called discourse of um, salvation. And I'm gonna start sharing a screen. Perfect. So the early Bolshevik idea of freedom and sexual affairs and decriminalization of sodomy um, law was not applicable to Muslim Central Asia. Uh, Dane Healy, for example, argues that the Bolsheviks believed that some societies were less prepared for social, sexual modernity than others, and that included 
Central Asian societies that were kind of feudal and patriarchal, backward, primitive, and semi-savage. Um, as I mentioned earlier that the Uzbek um, Criminal Code of 1926 prohibited, um, uh, had a number of articles prohibiting male same-sex same relations, consensual or forced. Um, and then there are these so-called backward peripheries of the Soviet empire, which included the newly formed republics of Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan, were among the first republics to actually um, institute these anti-sodomy regulations in their penal codes. So there are um, a couple uh, local practice practices. One is the Uzbek word for sodomy is bizokol bazlik, which is your male same-sex act, which is consensual. And then there was another practice of the boy dancers, Bacha Bozlik. So these boy dancers were these effeminate boys who dressed like girls, who danced and courted adult men. And that, Dean Healy argues, contradicted the idea of the Bolshevik modernity. He further um, posits that femininity in men was a ma marker of backwardness, imagined not in a Russian homosexual, but in the unfortunate Bachi of Turkestan. And if we look at the other work, works of um, historians, for instance, Afsani Najmabadi, um, in her work on 19th century Iran, when she um, works on uncovering the so-called gender tropes of Iranian modernity, she points out that gender, production of gender became a binary. And she points out to this heterosocialization of public space and exclusion of homoeroticism and same-sex practices. She also points out that beauty during earlier Qajar period was not distinguished by, by gender, but as the European gaze entered the scene of desire in the 19th century, uh, this relationship between a male, adult male and Amrat, who was a young adolescent beardless male relationship became hidden. And the absence of the beard became the marker of femininity. So I argue that Soviet criminalization of homosexuality in Central Asia in the words of Vera Tolt's Russia's own Orient, was in a way a continuity of the Russian imperialist legacy and its civilizing and subsequently modernizing mission. The range of these queer local practices, including forms of gender transgression, were deemed as perverted and backward. Male same-sex desire, particularly between adult males and adolescent young men, was perceived as almost an integral part of the native's culture. And the word that they use is tuziemce, which I think translating it to native doesn't do the word justice. Um, so they believed it was a part of the DNA. And again, all of the same-sex practices, consensual and forced, were lumped into the same category. And here's my first example. <clears throat> During my research trip to Russia, Moscow in summer 2016, I stumbled upon Vasilyevich Shagin's famous painting, Selling a Slave Boy, a part of his Turkish and series. A renowned painter spent several years in Turkestan while documenting Russia's military expansion into Central Asia. As an avid observer of local culture, he portrayed indigenous people, customs in their beat, every life, every everyday life. Um, this massive image of an old man, old rich man, closely examining the naked body's torso occupies the center of Vereshagin's showroom at Tritikovska Galeria, which is an important repository for Russian and Soviet cultural imagery. And I argue that it continues to play into the contemporary homo homophobic trope of associating homosexuality with pedophilia and child abuse, child abuse. And that continues to permeate post-Soviet consciousness to the present day. His other works um, portrays um, portraits of young Bachi boys and in a way by othering the colonial East and depicting these backward practices as such, I think the Rishagin's Turkistan series contributes to the pervasiveness of Russian and post-Soviet Orientalism. Um, I also looked at some of the travelogues of the ethnographers who lived in Russia. For example, a very well-known uh, Neil Lakoshin, a former military governor of Samarkand region. He spent 40 years in Turkestan and while advancing his military career, he also conducted scholarly work on history, culture, and the region. And in his well-known chapter, famous chapter, Away with Bachi, in his book, Half-Life in Turkestan, he describes this phenomenon of bachi boy dancers with disgust. And here's the quote, cross-dressed as young girls, bachi with the braids attached and women's jewelry would engage in a dance. Their dancing was ugly, ungracious and dull. And in Russian, it's like некрасив, некрациозен, неразнообразен. But the natives enjoyed it. Deprived of women's companionship, they're forced to be content with this crude falsification of a female dance. <clears throat> 
And again, subsequently, the Bolsheviks sought to eradicate this form as the form of male dancing or the prostitutes, as they call them, the bachi, which was considered to be one of the region's crimes. And it, in a way, uh, was embodied in this survival of primitive customs, along with practices of polygamy and bright price, kalim. However, there was a contrasting account about uh, the phenomenon of boy dancers in the series of autobiographical essays by Langston Hughes, which was published in Travel Magazine in 1934. While traveling throughout Central Asia in the 1930s, Hughes expresses his fascination with the existing local folk queer tradition that ceased to exist in the region with the beginning of the Bolshevik Revolution. Um, he basically says that from Fergana to Bukhara, from Osh to Samarkand, the great boy dancers before Stalin came were known and loved by the men who crowded the tea houses and dance fairs to see them perform. Only men took part in public performances of any sort. No women were allowed to dance or act. Uh, so while in Central Asia, actually, Hughes uh, has a chance to interview one of these musicians, musicians whose memories go far beyond the recent Bolshevik revolution. His name is Ahmedjan Akya Uzmazayev, and he played flute at the weddings of Ridge Bays. After the Bolshevik Revolution, he became an honored member of the National Orchestra. And in his interview to Langston Hughes, he actually elaborates on greatness of these dance fairs that used to be held throughout Turkestan. Wealthy base came from all corners of land to buy these boy dancers or to employ them as, as, as semi-permanent entertainers in the great walled gardens of their remote estates. Um, so these boys, and Hughes continues, they would put on their wigs with the girlish curls, their silken robes and bright bo boots. Then each one in turn would begin to circle to the mu music in the vast outer space, recreating in his own ways the pattern movement, the delicate churning of the head and wrists the, that characterize the Uzbek dance. The huge male audience would shout their approval as each especially beautiful traditional movement revealed itself anew, as, as expertly developed by the boy and the dusty ring. Again, um, it's the whole issue of boy dancers is very controversial. And we don't have any memoirs or writings of the former boy dancers. And multiple stories about these boy dancers have been written by travelers and ethnographers who went to Central Asia in the early 19th and uh, um, in the 19th and early 20th centuries. And most of the stories portray Bachi as these unfortunate victims of savage backward local customs whose parents or guardians sold them. Uh, basically into this business. Yet there's again this one particular story that, that stood out in Langston Hughes's memoir. Uh, there was this really fam famous boy dancer at Ahoja and the old man of Tashkent and Dijan spoke so highly of his art of dancing and he reserved his dancing entertainment services only for very few, uh, extremely rich bays. And when he danced at the fair, the pattern of his movement was quite intricate and delicate that 4,000 onlookers broke into roar after roar of shouts and cheers. So with the beginning of the Bolshevik revolution, this queer local practice, whatever you make out of it, got erased. So what happened to them? Um, suddenly, wonders like Langston Hughes, one year, there were no more dance fairs, there were no more boys in the tea house. And this musician who he interviewed, he's like, well, what happened? The revolution happened, all this changed. And today he says, a woman, Tamara Hanum, who is a distinguished female dancer, one of the first women who danced on the public stage while unveiled, she does the steps the Bacha used to do. Today, the young boys have jobs, they go to school, they belong to the Komsomol. And Hughes continues that none of these boys who were former dancing boys would talk to them and they would not talk about their past, especially to the visitors from the West. From the West. Um, and I guess his, this article, this particular article, his, I guess continue, continues inquiry into the fate of boy dancers throughout the essay conveys a critique of a new socialist modernity that excluded any forms of local queer representation or gender transgression. The other thing that got erased is not only the memory of this tradition, but the fact that many, many of these boys were killed. And uh, Shoshana Keller in her book, uh, to Moscow, not Mecca, cites a report that comments on jealous murders of these bacha boys who would leave one patron for another. And there were these rivalries uh, over these boys that often turn into group brawls. Um, there's another um, photo from the travelogue that I came across. 
Okay. So now I would like to talk a little bit more about Hujum. And again, I am not exactly an expert on unveiling. There have been books written, but I just want to present a somewhat of a, a concise summary. Take off the black pole, your coverall, open your face, be beautiful for all. Split and crush your chains to pieces, get rid of them, be free, proclaimed poet Ham Hamza Niazi in his poem to Uzbek women, dedicated to the campaign of unveiling in Uzbekistan. On March 8, 1927, thousands of women throughout Uzbekistan came to publicly burn their veils, which in this case was a form of a dress that consisted of two pieces. It was paranji, which was a heavy cotton robe, and it was a chachwan, which was a veil made out of um, horse, uh, woven horse hair. And Uzbek women and girls uh, over the age of 10, 12 were required to wear paranji outside of the household or in the presence of any men who were not a part of their family. Uh, and this Bolshevik massive unveiling campaign was a part of assault or attack on like on these old ways of female seclusion and inequality. And they really sought to eradicate this degrading symbol that was associated with patriarchal oppression, ignorance, and human disgrace. Um, Gregory Massel, for example, in the surrogate proletariat uh, argues that the Soviet Union was really, the Soviet authorities were really struggling to apply this Marxist concept uh, to, of a class struggle to the traditional uh, Muslim setting. Um, the masses didn't really operate that way, nor did they ever consider themselves belonging to the Marxist category of oppressed. And he says that the Bolsheviks saw a great potential in a Muslim female liberation woman to penetrate the traditional society with the communist agenda. And the strategy, strategy led to, quote, the novel, the unfamiliar realms of sexual and generational tension from a real proletariat to a surrogate for it. Um, then, of course, there's Douglas Northrop's um, well-known book, the Veiled Empire, and he, in the context of USSR as a colonial empire, he explores the origins, objectives, and outcomes of Hujum, and um, he argues that Hujum, in fact, was a um, he argues that Veiled Empire uh, was a response of Uzbek women to Hujum. Uh, veil represented patriarchal oppression, backwardness, and, re and regress, but in response to all the unveiling, many Muslim women embraced Veil as a sign of resistance. Um, and then, of course, there are these two narratives, and they were, there's so much more. And again, I, I talked about intersectionality at the beginning, that there, there's just so much more than, than to just these two concepts. Mariana Kemp, for example, in her work, draws attention um, draws her attention to the Central Asian pre-revolutionary pre, pre reformers known as Jadids. Um, according to Kemp, Jadids already turned their attention to the improvement of women. They called for women's education and changes in social practices that kept women in seclusion. And Turkestan as a whole did not really welcome the Bolshevik revolution, yet the Jadids were divided uh, between supporting the process of modernization and Russian domination. Uh, and Uzbek women actually, whose progress was influenced by, Jadid, by Jadidism prior to the revolution in 1917, later became equal partners in Soviet endeavor of transformation of Central Asia. Um, and I think it's important also to, uh, to, to notice that a lot of um, Jadids would later be purged during, during Stalin. Um, so while discussing unveiling, I thought it would be fun to demonstrate you a couple of sort of Orientalist tropes in the Soviet popular culture when it comes to the issue of harem, women, and Paranji, the veil. Uh, <clears throat> in the white sun of the desert, the protagonist Fyodor Sukhov a Red Army soldier is portrayed as a noble liberator and protector of Muslim women. In his efforts to modernize these women of the backward East, he urges them to take off their veils, forget their cursed past and have um, your own spouse. And I'm gonna show you the video. Не бойтесь, это наш господин. So, um, every time I I, I watch um, this this 
film, I'm thinking like they didn't cast the single Uzbek woman for this role. Uh, a more sort of accurate depiction of um, that same campaign was later portrayed in Ogni Ne Darogi, The Fiery Roads, 1977, which was produced by Uzbek film. That film was dedicated to the life and tragic fate of the poet, playwright, former Jadid and devout communist Hamza Hakim Zadeniazi, who was a huge proponent for women's education and liberation. So during the unveiling scene that I'm going to show you, the local women are portrayed as quite shy, scared, hesitant to cast their veils. Hamza, the man, walks around the crowd trying to convince them to get rid of their visible symbols of oppression and ignorance. But there's also an ongoing support of the Russian women who are perceived as the Slavic sisters, allies, and a fight against patriarchy and religion. А что говорить о других? Товарищи женщины, почему вы молчите? Сегодня же ваш день, 8 марта. Скажите же свое слово, женщины. Okay. <clears throat> so um, I thought these were really um, a great depictions of, uh, again, of portraying Central Asian women as backward, shy, and not having any agency. Um, so the goal of the Bolshevik campaign was, again, to eliminate all these backward customs and taboos, uh, among which were women's seclusion. Uh, arranged in child marriages, uh, bright price, and polygyny. But the campaign, of course, also had um, an economic goal to involve women in socialized production and move large numbers of women into the workforce, mainly on collective farms and textile industries. And this um, women's liberation movement was implemented by the Central Asian Bureau of the Central Committee of Old Union Communist Party, Sredas Bureau, and the women's section, Janadiel. And it gained a, tr gained a tremendous support uh, of such prominent Marxists of as Nadezhda Krupska, you know, so Arm Armand, and particularly Alexander Galantai. But interestingly enough, again, the difference that of that sexual freedom that was available in Soviet Russia in the 1920s was not applicable to the women of the East. For example, things like cohabitation were only possible in a context of legally registered marriage. Um, the attempt to translate the new Soviet laws governing marriage and family in the 1920s, as well as legal protection of women's rights, uh, into vernacular practices was quite complex. Um, so I'm just going to briefly uh, go through um, some of the things that um, the Bolshevik um, revolution brought. Uh, so there was a reform of the marriage code. Uh, divorce procedures became easier. Um, there was a minimum age for marriage, which was 16 years old. The state also legalized abortion and provided paid maternity leave and also rewarded those mothers who had more than 10 children. Um, but at the same time, it, all of that sort of contradicted multiple cultural and traditional mores of the Uzbek population because marriage was perceived as a contract between the two families and Kalim, this bright price, defined the value of a woman. And also many local party officials, while supporting women's campaign of liberation, remained faithful to the Islamic practice of polygamy. Um, but um, again, if we're talking about sort of the positive examples, um, Langston Hughes and his... Um, in his essay in, in an Emir's Harem, he talks about this woman, Zivara Zik. She was a former wife of, of the Emir of Bukhara, and she was brought into the harem when she was 12. Um, and then she said that he had multiple wives and he often gave them away as a present to his mistress and military officers. So after leaving the harem and after the Bolshevik revolution, she learned how to read, write, and count uh, at the age of 26. And that enabled her to earn her living as a cashier in a tea house in Bukhara. Moreover, um, she divorced her second husband and now she, and she lived without any fear of being uh, left behind without any means. So the government initially planned to complete her June within six months. And we have these numbers, for example, on March 8th, 
March 8, 1927, 100,000 women unveiled. But these numbers are so arbitrary because this, the, the whole unveiling campaign, and it was not, it was not linear. Uh, some women didn't want to do it. Some women obeyed. Some women unveiled and revealed because it was the matter of issue. And then in between, we have violence, uh, a really gruesome violence against women. Uh, in most cases, unveiled women were threatened, raped, or murdered by their own male relatives who carried out the act uh, in support of family honor. For example, uh, I'm going back to uh, the poet Hamza. He dedicated the poem, um, Plucked Flowers, to the women who became victims during Hujum. He commemorates each woman by her name and poignantly describes the murder scene. So Marhon was soaked in blood and her face was white scotted. Onyiso died while begging her husband Abdullah to spare her life. By taking her paranji off, Kumushon finally believed in her dream, but the dream did not last long. Um, again, we have sort of this um, existing rising violence against women that was def difficult to stop uh, and it was ongoing. At the same time, another strategy employed by the party was in a way training of these local cadres and organization of social, uh, social clubs, which allowed people like Tamara Hanum to publicly day, dance on stage. Going back to Langston Hughes and his essay, Tamara Hanum, Soviet's Asia Greatest Dancer, he discusses how she, by breaking down the patriarchal tradition of dance that was strictly limited to male dancers, she became the first woman on the contemporary, in the contemporary Uzbek history to ever perform on the public stage. And it also marked the beginning of the Uzbek theater, the opening of the Uzbek theater to female artists. Um, and uh, these are some of the videos of you, the women uh, joining the communist party. And you see some of them still wearing paranji. Some just have a head cover. The woman at the table, at the desk, she uh, doesn't have anything. And in case of Tamar Hanum, Unveiling and dance was an act of defiance. Um, this is a remarkable video of her dancing at the opening of Fergana Canal. And this was one of those industrial projects of, um, of the Soviet colonialism when people basically had to dug the canal with, with their shovels, kit mains, uh, and uh, uh, she was there to sort of propose the morale. Back. I think I'm going to mention again, going back to the whole violence against uh, women, we have um, several cases of women artists dying at the hands of their male relatives who considered women on the stage to be a disgrace. And this is the statue of Nurhon Yildasho in Margilan. Um, she was an Uzbek dancer who was again also among one of the first women to remove their veil. And she, she was murdered at the age of 16 by her brother. And um, she was, of course, remembered. But after uh, Uzbekistan gained independence, the statue was taken down as a process of de-Sovietization. And I think I'm out of time, but I am happy to s bring up some of the contemporary issues in the Q&A section. Michelle? Thank you very much, Feruza. Um, before we take questions from the audience, I had a couple of questions. One of them is the distinction between viewing Central Asians as backward and viewing them, particularly women, as a surrogate proletariat, as an advance vanguard, really, uh, for the revolution. Can you talk about uh, how that kind of, how they uh, combine those really, how the, the Bolsheviks really uh, 
justified those. Yeah, well, as I, um, as I argued, I think it's sort of a continuity of the Russian imperial presence and the way uh, the locals, Puziemtsi, right? Again, the word native doesn't really do the word of justice. The way they have been perceived, that, that, that men have been perceived as if they have DNA for desiring young, young boys in their blood. It's a part of their cultural establishment. And the same thing with women, because they're secluded they're sort of are seen as completely powerless. Um, again, sort of they've seen as, a, as having no agency whatsoever, even though again, the stories are so different. There were women who veiled because they resisted, but that was not seen as resistance. And I think, I think Marcel is right that um, it was difficult to apply a Marx, Marxist concept of, of the oppressed uh, you know, the whole class struggle to Central Asian context, because also there was religion, Islam played a huge role. And I think the failure of, of Soviet modernization project really was not considering all these nuances. Uh, it was sort of, a, in a way, like, a, let's just get rid of the paranja, that's it, that's going to help. But uh, again, it was highly contested and, um, and highly gendered. Uh, Yes, on one hand, you have sort of the social economic benefits of the Soviet system provided to women, such as education, participation in labor force, political representation. But on the other hand, it was a colonial project. There was failure of modernity versus tradition. And I love how actually Madina Tlastanova, this is a quote from her book. She said, Soviet modernity destroyed the complex and nuanced models of interaction between indigenous thinking and Islam, which had been refined in the societies for centuries. Uh, the Soviet empire was Eurocentric and patriarchal in spite of its rhetoric. Well, I mean, that certainly was also true and I've seen it in my own research in the way in which the Bolsheviks viewed women workers in European Russia who were all, the concept of backwardness was used in many different contexts and certainly was used uh, in relation to European Russian uh, women workers as well. Um, so, but to get on to some of the other things that you're talking about, um, the unveiling campaign um, and the, uh, one of the things that seems to be true throughout the campaign and then over the course of the Soviet Union and its history in Central Asia is kind of underestimating the backlash. Uh, and if you could talk a little bit about the ebbs and flows of unveiling campaigns, because they went all the way up into the Brezhnev period, Khrushchev and Brezhnev, who also tried to push unveiling and push against Islam and Islamic, what they considered to be uh, uh, practices that were backward again uh, in relation to women. Could you talk about the backlash and how that affected? Right, I think it's um, Shirin Akiner, um, one of the scholars, um, she talks about veiling as resistance that despite the fact that, you know, there was this massive campaign of unveiling, women considered veil as a shield. For them, this was, this, it represented the order in society. So especially in the rural areas, women continued to veil deep into the 1950s. And I think if you look at this contested legacy, and again, once the Soviet Union collapsed, there's sort of this return to, to religion, return to um, Islam, return to religious traditions. Um, so I think that shows you that this whole massive, com com massive unveiling campaign, campaign, even though it might have sounded good on the paper. It was so contested and it didn't work entirely because again, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, you see sort of the, again, retraditionalization that we're gonna talk about probably later. Um, and the other thing too, um, violence against women. Uh, that to me is just, it's, it blows my mind. Every time I read these stories, I mean, even, even again, despite Hamza being sort of an ideological poet, but that poem and these, all these women who were killed because of the cause. Uh, and, and was that needed? Was that effective? Um, so this, I think, really underestimates the power of, of the campaign itself. 
I think, I mean, that's one of the great things about your talk is that you're really discussing in general the complexities of social change. And we've just seen that in our own society and we're seeing it with some of the TV series now like Mrs. America, which talks about the backlash against the Equal Rights Amendment and the kind of general underestimating of backlash uh, and the ways in which uh, traditional practices can have some appeal to women. It's not only the violence against women which keeps these practices going. It's, it can be, as you've talked about, women buying into some of the reasons for uh, veiling in this case. Absolutely. And um, if we talk about sort of the, the current day, um, I, I don't even think that the veiling campaign is remembered. Um, in a way, this is now we have the sort of the, another hegemonic narrative that condemns the Soviet project, that this was, you know, a colonial project. But with that comes erasure of these murdered women erasure of the women who actually fought and wanted to unveil and were dedicated to the cause. And it also comes to the current amnesia when it comes to all the queer local practices that were happening in the region for centuries. So again, um, I think that's why Madina's um, concept of subaltern really brings all these multitude of voices that are not exactly in unison with each other. So Faruza, can you just describe, can you just explain what subaltern means? Because not everybody may. Know. Right. So this concept of subaltern is really, um, in a way it's recovering these marginalized voices, voices that have not been heard before. My goal really to kind of bring these narratives about these boy dancers, because we don't know anything about them. Were they victims? Did they have agency? Maybe they were victims at the beginning, but then they really liked what they were doing. We don't know. But there are all these questions that are worth asking. As, and as a, I think as a historian, they were marginalized and then they were erased. And the same thing with women. You know, we, we have the sort of narrative of a noble Slav, you know, Bolshevik walking and rescuing, liberating all these women or even local men like Hamza, who is all about, you know, encouraging women. But what about the women's voices? And I think also Mariana, Mariana Kemp's work is really essential because she goes um, into the core of the Jadid movement. So there was this intellectual movement in, in Uzbekistan uh, prior to the Bolshevik revolution. And she goes in, she interviews, she has these interviews with these women. And I think it's, that's what subaltern means. Like that's what, it's, it's so important to, to, to recover um, those voices uh, because they would just go again. That would be a backlash against these sort of this hegemonic narrative of Soviet liberator and current desovietization. Yeah, they're kind of totally marginalized and outside of the, off the, under the radar, off the web. Right, right. So uh, I also, I, it is important also to recognize that there were women from, uh, Russian women, Soviet women who came into the Central Asia and advocated for unveiling and were also murdered, uh, a number of them. Absolutely. Uh, uh, kind of outside agitators or however, um, and risked their lives in this as well. Um, so uh, could you talk a little bit about, uh, you talk about the Soviet, the Bolshevik attitudes towards homosexuality and the difference between the decriminalization in European areas and the criminalization in Central Asia. And can you talk about how attitudes to homosexuality have evolved from the 1920s to now in Central Asia, uh, in the Soviet period and then beyond? Right, so in Central Asia, there are two, Repub two countries, uh, two nation states, Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan, where homosexuality is still illegal as a direct outcome of the Soviet reg regulations. In fact, um, homophobia has been on the rise and I think Russia and uh, anti-gay propaganda law played a big role in that. Um, I have, it's kind of like, so it's sort of a, it's been there, but I think the very first remark was in February, 2016, when the president while addressing, who passed away, while addressing national delegates of the Tashkent region made remarks about 
obscene culture of the West and cast people who are engaged in same-sex relations as mentally unwell. So this was one of his first public remarks about it. But then we have, um, again, I read on uh, Radio, uh, Radio Free Europe, um, there was a, a young old gay man, or he was possibly trans, who was murdered after uh, coming out on Instagram. Um, one of my, um, I interviewed one of the people who is an um, LGBTQ asylee who lives here in New York City. Uh, he received multiple death threats and, you know, how people would tell him you're not, you're not Uzbek, you know, you're not Uzbek, we don't have that. You know, there's all this sort of backlash, but again, if you sort of dig into history that there have been these local traditions. And again, there was consensual, there was a traditional board dance, there were these all multiple forms of same-sex practices, but for whatever reason, the Bolsheviks deemed them as backwards. Again, where in Russia, homosexuality was decriminalized in 1922, and it wouldn't get criminalized until 1934 under Stalin. Um, thank you for for that. Let's uh, see about. I'm going to get to questions from the audience. <clears throat> um, can you? The first question: Can you talk about the effects of Soviet politics on bride kidnapping in different parts of Central Asia during both Soviet and post-Soviet years? Right. Um, Bride kidnapping is not exactly my expertise. Uh, I, and also Central Asia was sort of divided between the nomads and the settlers and the Uzbek were the settlers. So bride kidnapping was not exactly um, a part of the culture where in Kyrgyz culture or Kazakh culture, that would be sort of a more of a concept that existed. Um, however, um, and this is again, Mariana Camp's research. She talked about um, the so-called Basmachi right, the local insurgents who fought against uh, the Soviets. And uh, so there was this um, under the, I wouldn't call it a tradition, but they actually kidnapped women. And because they were um, fighting against the Soviets, they would often raid a village and they would kidnap women. So when it comes to Uzbekistan, I know that that existed, but the overall uh, bride kidnapping, um, I, I'm sorry, that's not exactly my air expertise, so I don't really want to elaborate much on that. Uh, let's see what other questions we have here. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, there's a lot of questions. Let's see. Um, were similar campaigns of liberation and empowerment from the Soviet perspective carried out amongst other minority cultures in the Soviet Union? Absolutely. And this is, um, again, uh, bringing uh, Madina Tlastanova back. She talks also about Caucasus and the way those campaigns, you know, carried out there. And um, I particularly focused on Uzbekistan, but um, um, I read an article prior to, um, as I was preparing for the talk about Kyrgyzstan, where there was a similar campaign. Um, so, yeah, and again, especially when it comes to sort of the Orient, uh, and th in this case, it's Central Asian Caucasus, there were these campaigns. Um, I don't necessarily think it was an unveiling campaign in Caucasus, but it was definitely clashing be between the tradition and modernity, right? And in their case, tradition, some of the traditions were even much stronger. Uh, so, uh, so somebody might be able to do a kind of comparative uh, study of really the different ways in which the Soviets sought to transform cultures outside of European Russia. Absolutely. Uh, let me see. Uh, do you know of any difference between Tatar and local Jadidist thought vis-a-vis -vis gender and sexuality? Can you repeat the question again? Do you know of any differences between tar Tatar and local Jadidist thought vis-a-vis -vis gender and sexuality. Um, again, from this is Mariana Kemp's work. Um, she talks about Tatar Jadid movements, and in a way, it sort of influenced the way it influenced because um, all the Jad the Jadids were in a way in touch with each other. Many of them were educated, and um, there was sort of somewhat of an informal kind of a network. So they were right. The, the Tatars were um, definitely in a dialogue with the Jadids in, in Uzbekistan. So that's, and of course, they um, unveiling was um, 
I think in the 1920s, there's a picture of these Tatar women and none of them wore a veil. So they were quite, their views were quite similar, um, but except in, I think the culture, the, the, the Tatar culture at the time was, was um, somewhat more open versus the culture of Uzbekistan where the tradition was definitely much more ingrained and strict when it came to women. Mm. Let's see what else we have here. Uh, how is the unveiling campaign remembered in Central Asia now? Is it seen as a disruption of local culture and tradition or as a necessary step towards modernization and female empowerment? Well, I think for the longest time, uh, the, there was an attempt to sort of erase the Soviet past. And uh, so the whole project of Sovietiz Sovietization was seen as as, as again, as, as a colonial project that really deprived the local population from doing anything of their own. Um, some of the statues, for example, the statue that I showed of this dancer, um, that, st that statue was de demolished. Um, so, but I think with the, with the current, the, the past three years with the, with the new government, I think um, all of a sudden this is, you know, a celebration of the 9th of May which was not the case previously. Um, but I would say it's not remembered as vividly. You know, I mean, there's Tamar Hanum, uh, the, the, the dancer who, 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 is, who is so magnificent and has such an incredible legacy. She has her museum, but it's, you know, if you probably ask someone in the region, they might not remember who she was. So it's, um, the, I can I actually show you something um, quickly. All right. There was a, this um, photo uh, of Basharat Mirbabaeva. So she was um, the one of the first women who drove the locomotive, and she also was one of the first women who jumped with a parachute. So she was quite commemorated. There's still a picture of her at the railroad museum in Tashkent, but. She died in 2010 and nothing, you know, no commemoration of, of her. Uh, so yeah, uh, I would say it's probably remembered in the capital, but, and uh, yeah. Let's see what else we have. Um, since you focus mostly on Uzbek examples in your talk, could you shed more life, light on any notable continuities or contrasts in the wider Central Asian space? Right, well, I think um, I could talk more about the issue of homophobia because this is what I'm focusing on. And uh, my, my colleague, Samuel Bulov, who did his research in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan, really also talks about sort of the, the Russian influence um, with the anti-gay propaganda law on these countries. And again, it is, it is a continuity of, from, of the Soviet legacy, um, you know, and, and, and again, when you, when you talk about homophobia in particular, um, one has to remember that it, did, didn't, it didn't just appear, but it's, it's, there has been sort of a continuity and there are all these tropes associated with homosexuality. And in Central Asia, there are all these tropes also associated with, with, female, with, with male femininity that are seen as, um, as um, contrary to, to your typical state masculinity. Um, so I think there's definitely a, a continuity in when it comes to state-sponsored homophobia all over uh, Central Asia, and I would say, and beyond, of course. Um, so, you know, talk, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, I, yeah, I, I, I cannot really speak much on the um, contemporary experiences of women all over Central Asia. I guess I, so I've done, when I was doing this research, when I talk about contemporary developments, I kind of focused on the first 15 years and of post-independence. And I, you know, I watched the shows, I read the newspapers, and I really looked how this, this image of a, of a woman who you know drove the first locomotive uh, changed to sort of this woman surrounded by her family and she's a mother, you know she's sitting uh, at the cradle. Um, so this whole idea of womanhood is now embodied in, in maternity and family. 
And those were the images that you see in sort of in state-run media. Also, there are these um, shows um, about women's happiness that I watched and you know that the, what wants happiness is, is is all about the family. It's no, it's never about your individual. And again, uh, the, the the whole promotion of all, you know when the Soviets really promoted quote unquote women to sort, sort of equal position to men, right? And then women could jump with a parachute. You don't really see that anymore. Um, so I don't even know where I'm going with that. <laughs> I think I lost my train of thought. But uh, well, what you you know what you have said in the past is that. The, before the emphasis was on women's roles outside the home, uh, as you said, kind of emancipation and women becoming equal to men doing uh, what are often were defined as male work, like being the uh, engineer of a locomotive driving. Right. Uh, whereas now the emphasis is more on the family, woman's role in the family, woman's role as a mother, that those are the things that are more emphasized and that could be considered to be re-traditionalization. Right, and at the same time, you have, you know, gastrobiters, these women workers who work in Russia, who go to Russia for seasonal work. And those are the women who do hard job. You know, those are the women who actually work men's jobs. Some of them probably work men's jobs. Um, there's a, a, uh, I think it's Madeline Reeves, who is a, 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 an anthropologist in Central Asia. She talks about this phenomenon, these women workers, the gastrobiters, you know, how they, the amount of physical work that they have to do to sort of send uh, commissions to their families uh, is, is absolutely incredible. Uh, and then we don't really hear much about it. We have, you know, we have the state promoting this, you know, idea of womanhood, but they're, they're, again, behind the scenes, the subaltern women, uh, are doing all kinds of works um, to sort of support their families and to, to, to really make means to survive. And does that include sex trafficking and uh, prostitution as well, or is that? Right, that probably does, except we don't really have reliable statistics on that, I believe. Mm -hmm. Let me see if there are more questions. Uh... Yeah, you sort of uh, answered this question. There's an evidence of a resurgence in women wearing veils in Central Asia today. Do you think it's a form of resistance uh, related to the Soviet campaign or due to other factors? And you've pretty much answered that, but maybe you want to add something else. I think that there are many factors and um, there could be, um, again, returning to religion. There also could be fashion. If you look at some of these really fashionable women. Yes, of course, there's a, a whole issue of faith, but at the same time, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's so fancy and, and women sort of really um, use their agency to pick their outfits, you know, because with, with, with Paranji, it was sort of kind of like very similar black. And, and I think with, with hijab, yes, women do cover. Uh, and I think it's some of them do it voluntarily. Others might be forced to do it, uh, but we don't, I don't really have the statistics to sort of confirm that. But um, for many women, it's a choice. Uh, and uh, um, yeah, so that's, and again, that's, that's interesting that hijab actually was really not seen, right? If you look at these videos from the 1920s, 1930s, hijab was really not a part of the culture. It's sort of, that's, that's more of a modern kind of trend that came uh, probably from, uh, from Saudi Arabia and uh, that sort of influenced um, this, um, this trend. So what you're saying is that while there could be a re-traditionalization, a kind of moving back uh, in the sense of women's, women covering their heads, it has evolved into more a hijab as opposed to actually a full veil. Absolutely. Right, yeah. absolutely. And sort of there has been a funny kind of relationship with um, between government and, and, and veiling this, this contemporary sort of veiling. Uh, uh, there was a campaign in the, in the, at the end of the 90s where um, women were not allowed to wear hijabs to the public universities. And I remember that vividly because I was myself at school and uh, I had a couple of friends who, who were veiled and then basically they told them, as you enter the university, you have to take it off. As you go outside, you can wear it again. But this is sort of, kind of sort of a French in a way approach, but 
that that evaporated. So it was a sort of brief moment that I personally encountered because again, my friends were going through a really hard time. Some of them wanted to quit school because of that, because for them, wearing hijab was a part of them and they just didn't want to give it up. Uh, so yeah, it's in a way it, it's for, I guess for many Westerners, especially hijab might seem as a, as again, as a sort of a sign of oppression. But again, I think we have to remember that many women choose to wear it to wear it and many women in Uzbekistan as well. But I mean, in a way you could argue that it's actually an evolution from the full uh, hiding of, uh, of the, of the uh, niqab, the, the full veil to the hijab, which is much less uh, hidden. I mean, your face is, is there. So in a way that's a concession to the West Western values because it's not going back to a full veil. So somewhere in the middle is where it seems to have wound up. I wanted to say also that retraditionalization, uh, just ask you about that because in a way it's not an accurate uh, description of what's going on because in fact in Central Asian cultures, it seems like at least in terms of the relationship to boy dancers that there was more of an openness to same-sex desire. Uh, so to say retraditionalization when you're becoming very homophobic with laws and claiming to return to traditional values, in fact, those are not traditional values in Central Asia. Right, yeah, I absolutely agree with you. Yeah, it's um, again, sort of, the, as I mentioned earlier, there's sort of this erasure of this local queer practices and uh, that it just, it never existed, right? Um, uh, so I think when it comes to women and gender, maybe we could apply the term retraditionalization because again, as uh, Gill and Kligman, they sort of argue, argued that once the state withdrew its support, women sort of, in a nutshell, went back to the traditional gender roles. But um, I think when it comes to um, the issue of queerness, uh, I, do, I don't think that quite applies. The other thing too, um, I was gonna show uh, a couple of just modern images that I um, that I was able to uh, to pick for this research uh, a while ago. Let me see. So, okay, there we go. So this is um, the one on the left is uh, a National Democratic Party of Uzbekistan. And this is sort of, they released this image. I took it off their website. And then it was this UNDP campaign about, you know, that I'm a modern Uzbek woman and I'm happy. And again, as you see, uh, the mother-in-law on both pictures is a, is, a, is a crucial element of the nuclear family. <laughs> Nothing can be done without her permission, which also is something, you know, it's such a huge difference between the, uh, the, the sort of the Soviet images. I don't know, we have, yeah, uh, I, I took it off uh, there. You see sort of the images from, from, the, from the Soviet times where women are kind of like, you know, studying their engaged activities, uh, it shows sort of the progress, but uh, these two uh, images, I, I thought, you know, they are about womanhood, but it's about womanhood in the context of the family. So Farisa, we're almost out of time. And I wanted to see if you wanted to maybe sum up uh, what kinds of takeaways you wanted people to have from your talk, if there are a couple of points that you um, want people to uh, take away and think about? Yeah, well, as I said at the beginning when I um, mentioned a little disclaimer about intersectionality, uh, and again, I have, we have to remember that it's, it's, it's never one particular narrative, that there are all these various voices and it's often so deeply contested. And I think uh, my job as a historian is, is try to sort of cover that. Uh, and again, my opinion in this case doesn't really matter. I just want to bring what, what's out there. Uh, and we will have to say that the Soviet legacy of unveiling and banning same-sex queer practices was highly contested when it came to building this gendered socialist modernity in the region. And they really failed to work with tradition and religion. And I think after the collapse of the Soviet Union, religion came back full force, tradition came back full force, and I think that speaks volumes. Um, and when it comes to, um, I guess, contemporary um, homophobia, 
I think recovering these voices is, is instrumental because these voices are absent from the popular memory uh, and they existed. And I'm sure there are accounts and hopefully we'll come across some of the accounts um, of people who lived prior to the you know, great uh, uh, Russian revolution. And again, it, 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 they were there and it existed despite the fact that all these hegemonic narratives are trying to sort of suppress that. And I think it's, it's, it's important to uncover and uh, recover those voices. So we have a more of a complete picture about the past. So it is uh, just another example of those who don't know their own history are doomed to repeat it. Right, right. So thank you very much, Feruza. This was excellent. And uh, I hope that our audience learned a lot from your presentation. I know I learned from your pre I always learn from your presentations. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much also to all the listeners. And uh, again, if I didn't answer any of your questions, hopefully there will be another opportunity. But Hope also everyone is staying safe and healthy these days. And again, uh, thank you to the Davis Center for this remarkable opportunity. Uh, thank you, Rochelle, as always. Thank you. Thank you to everyone, too. Okay. Yes.